All right, now when I get youngsters in here, I try to impress on them the importance of mathematics in doing machine work because you're literally starting with a, a block of material and you have to sit down and do all your calculations as to what am I going to remove from that material to end up with the part that I want because that part is in, in that block, you just have to bring it out. So here's an example right here. This is called a jack-in-the-box or a jack-in-the-cube and I sat down and I did my calculations because what I want to arrive at is to enable this jack to turn any which way inside this frame but not to come out. So what I do is I machine five sides. I don't do the sixth face because that base material is holding onto the jack while I do all my machine work on each face. Then I fill the whole thing up with a very hard wax known as machinable wax, which is approximately the density of aluminum and melts at about 175 degrees. That holds onto the part while I do the sixth face. Then when I melt the wax out, it becomes loose. And there's other applications for this, such as a pendant. This is all machined out of solid brass. It's about seven or eight hours of work right there to end up with that pendant. And there's other applications too. Uh, here is an example of dice in a box. The dice float around. Now they don't spin like that because you want them to end up in a stable uh, display. Now I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of a trivia question. Does anyone know what the dots on a dice are actually called? They have an official name, and that is pips, P-I-P-S. Think of Gladys Knight and the pips. I also throw out some other useless information. If you throw down a die and there is a four showing, opposite face will be a three. If there is a five showing, opposite face will be a two. It's always going to add up to seven. And another thing we make in here is dice earrings, dice in a box earrings, and uh, they are available up front. Okay, we're going to talk a briefly about the engine that I'm building here. This is a one-quarter scale model of a Kinner five-cylinder radial aircraft engine. Now, these engines were built by Kinder Manufacturing from 1925 till the end of the Second World War, and the engine has actually been used on this aircraft. This is a Ryan PT-22 trainer built by Ryan Aviation in San Diego. These aircraft were used by the Army Air Corps and the Navy to train pilots during the Second World War. The instructor sat here, and the student sat here, and you could see the engine right here. Now, I'm building this engine actually to a set of blueprints that are taken from the full-size engine and scaled down to one quarter th that size. Where that engine is about five foot in diameter, this engine is about 15, 16 inches in diameter. Now, if you're interested in building a scale model aircraft engine, there's a website you can look up and you tell the company what engine you want to build and you tell them what scale you want to build and they'll furnish you for a price with a set of blueprints. So we purchased this uh, blueprint package about seven years ago and I actually started on this with the former master machinist here, Tom Boyer. And Tom did the majority of the work on this piece right here. This is the crankcase. That started out as a two and a half inch thick by 80 inch square piece of aluminum and there's about 500 hours of machine work right there in that part. From that point on, I've done about 99% of the uh, parts that are going into this engine. Uh, we'll talk about some of the components. Here we have one of the pistons. Each of these pistons have on them three piston rings. The piston rings are made from a micro grain cast iron and to produce about 36 of these took approximately 400 hours of work. Uh, it's a very delicate operation. Inside the engine, there is one master connecting rod. The master connecting rod 
likewise has a piston on it, as well as the other four pistons and connecting rods that fasten to it by means of a pin. So if you were to put this together as a sub-assembly and lay it down, it's going to look like a star. Now, radial engines are referred to as round engines and they're comprised of odd numbers of cylinders. The engine will either be three cylinders per bank, this is called a bank or a row, five cylinders, seven or nine. A three and a five is going to be a relatively small engine. Generally, it's going to be a single bank. When you get into seven cylinders or nine cylinders and you're at the design stage and you require more horsepower, you just layer these or stack them up. Two, layer, uh, two banks or four banks. Uh, as an example, the Navy Corsair from the Second World War is nine cylinders in a bank, two banks that gives you an 18-cylinder engine. The first engines used on the B-36 bomber and the Spruce Goose were Pratt & Whitney R4360s. They are seven cylinders in a bank, four banks. That's a 28-cylinder engine putting out approximately 3,500 horsepower. Now, what we have here is a model I made up. I, I found it on the internet and downloaded it for free. And we printed this out on our 3D printer. This is approximately uh, 800 to 900 hours of printing time on a 3D printer, but it shows you what's going on inside of a radial engine. Here we have the master connecting rod, comprised of a flange that all the other connecting rods fasten to. So as the engine is operating, it is operating like this. Many people can't understand the concept of why the connecting rods don't get all tangled up. Well, there's an explanation right there because they're all pushing this master connecting rod, which right here is connected to the crankshaft. On the other end, the crankshaft becomes the prop shaft and that's turning the, the propeller. Now, this is a four cycle engine. That means it, it goes through four cycles in four revolutions. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. And the way that works, the piston is, this piston is at top dead center. Both valves are closed. This is intake, this is exhaust. As the piston goes down, the intake valve opens, allowing in fuel air mixture. Both valves close. That's your intake. Then the piston is driven upwards by the action of the other pistons. That's your compression stroke. It compresses that fuel air mixture into a volatile uh, combustible portion. At that point, just below top dead center, the spark plug ignites the mixture. The explosion drives that piston down. That's your power stroke. Now, as the piston starts up on the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve opens, pushing out the exhaust fumes, and it goes back into the next cycle again. And all of these other cylinders are doing the same thing in sequence. Now, when we talk about sequence, let's talk about the firing order. The firing order on a radial engine is odd cylinders and even. So for an example, this is number one cylinder. Number one would fire, then number three, then number five, then two, and then four. So it's one, three, five, two, four. A nine cylinder would fire one, three, five, seven, nine, two, four, six, eight. We're gonna start here, folks, with uh, our famous do nothing machine. The machine was put together by the gentleman you see in the picture who was actually a landscaper up in the Los Angeles area. But he had a hobby of repairing clocks. So he accumulated a bunch of gears, sprockets, chains, and various other devices and incorporated them in this structure here. There's over 740 gears involved in this thing. And here is the main heart of the device right in through here. This is a component of a Norden bombsite, and it extends all the way down to the base. The Norden bombsite was actually a mechanical computer manufactured by Sperry Gyroscope. It was used in our bombers to aid them in precision bombing from 30 or 40,000 feet, and it was a top secret device during the war. Well, it comes along about 1945, the war is over, a year or two later, the Air Force takes a look at these things and determined that they were obsolete. 
There's new technology that has replaced them, so they decide they're going to just scrap them. Well, this gentleman found this device in, found this component, I should say, in a surplus store in the Los Angeles area and envisioned building something out of it. So he took it home, started on the construction on this thing, incorporated all these other gears and chains and various things, and here it is, the do-nothing machine. Now down here we have a device called a rack and pinion that converts circular motion into linear motion or vice versa. Here we have a segment of a oil pump from a Volkswagen car. Down there is the motor that's driving the heart of the mechanism and that is out of an old slot machine. Up here we have a track that's actuated by three cams. Now a cam is a hub that's driven by a shaft that's off center. So as it goes around, you have a high point and a low point to each cam. Visualize using or rolling an egg from the round end to the pointy end, round end to the pointy end. Two of these cams will go to the high point, one at the low point. That will create a slope in the track. By gravity, the ball is going to roll downhill to the lower portion. Here's an interesting arrangement here. You have a small motor driving a series of gears, driving these bevel gears. A bevel gear allows you to transmit power at a right angle. And then on this end, it's driving a sprocket, which is feeding a chain up to this sprocket. On the end of that sprocket's a gear that's intermeshing with this gear, which then intermeshes with this gear and turns this gear and this gear. Here are a bunch of little rods being pushed back and forth by a series of cams. Now we've had some very interesting comments made about this machine and the one that sticks with me, it was my favorite. It was made by a gentleman who described it in this manner. He said, what we have here is motion, we have movement, and it makes noise but it doesn't do much of anything. It's pretty much associated with Congress, or pretty much similar to Congress. The two switches you see down here control the two motors on the upper platform, because when something goes wrong with this machine, I have to fix it. So I can isolate the two motors, and that somewhat narrows down my search for where the problem lies. Now what we're going to talk about here is something to carry on the uh, importance of mathematics. Uh, what I'm holding here is what's called a Euler's disk. Now Leonard Euler, spelled E-U-L-E-R but pronounced Euler in Swiss or German, was a mathematician who lived in the 1700s. Now he wrote a lot of our algebraic formulas. He also wrote in a paper describing the physics, the math, the geometry, friction, gravity, all kind of factors that go into causing this to do what's called sproiling. If you've ever taken a coin and hold, held it on its edge and then flipped it, it will spin for a matter of a couple of seconds. It won't spin for very long because it does not have the right proportions, the right ratio. That is six to one. So if this disc were one inch thick, it would be six inches in diameter. If it were three inches in diameter, it'd be a half inch thick. This one happens to be about two and a half inches in diameter and a little over three eighths of an inch thick. What's very important here is this radii on the corner. It's corner radii. A corner radii is 90 degree segment of a circle. On a clock, if you went from 12 o'clock to three o'clock through an arc, that is a corner radius. This radius happens to be about 20 thousandths, 0.020. Now, a radius, of course, is half of a, a, or a quarter of a circle, and that would make your diameter a full 40 thousandths, 0 0.040. 40 thousandths is approximately 10 times the diameter of a hair. So what we're going to do, we're going to give this a little s spin, and it's going to go from a vertical to a horizontal position by going through this action called sproiling. And now this is going to take well over a minute. Now, in slow motion, this will look like it's floating on air. Now, 
I refer to do this as a senior fidget spinner. All right, now that was the plain and simple version. Now we're gonna show you one that's a little more complex. This one looks like a flying saucer. Now, it has six windows. So what's gonna happen while it's going through this spoiling motion, watch the windows because they're gonna create a strobe effect. At one point, the windows are gonna to appear to be rotating clockwise, then they're gonna stop, they're gonna go counterclockwise, and they're gonna do that several times in, during the duration of this spoiling. Now they're going clockwise, they're going to stop and go counterclockwise. Now a little further down here, they're going to go clockwise again, right there. And again, they will come back and go counterclockwise. Okay. Well, on this end of the bench, we're going to describe some models of engines that are from the 1800s. Now, both of these engines are known as external combustion engines because the heat source is on the outside of the engine, unlike a lawnmower engine, a motorcycle, a car engine, if it's not electric, the heat source is on the inside of the engine. That's an internal combustion engine. These are external combustion engine. And the first one we're going to talk about is a Stirling. Now, the Stirling engine was invented around 1840 by a Scottish minister who was also an engineer. Its first application was to pump water out of coal mines, like in Wales, England, and Scotland. Up to that point, you had 10-year-old kids operating pump handles to get the water out of the mines. Here you have a pulley that you'd have a belt running to whatever device you want to run, whether it be a pump or some other mechanism. Now, this is a, a closed system. There is no intake or exhaust with this engine. In this chamber, we're heating the air that's causing the air to expand and push the piston that's in this cylinder back toward me. Now, when the piston reaches the extent of its travel, in other words, when the connecting rod is straight out and connected at about 9 o'clock in that position, that allows that hot air to vent through an internal port that commonly is known as a drilled hole into this canister. The canister has a series of fins on it to give off heat. In giving off heat, we're gonna cool down the air on the internal part. That's gonna cause the air to condense and thereby create a partial vacuum. That vacuum is gonna travel through this tube into this cylinder. The vacuum in this cylinder is drawing that piston that way. The pressure in this cylinder is pushing this piston this way. Now they are going in opposite directions but through their connecting rods, they're hooked up to the flywheels 90 degrees apart. Consider this one at 12 o'clock and this one at nine o'clock. Here's your pulley to run to whatever device you wanna run. So keep in mind this piston is pushing, this piston is pulling. Now this is an 1840 invention and you would think this is rather old technology and probably forgotten about. That's not necessarily the case because there are modern applications for Stirling engines. The Swedish Navy powers one class of their submarines on a Stirling engine, much more sophisticated than this, and their power source is their batteries to heat a heating element. There's also a generating station between here and Arizona, and to run the pumps to cool down their equipment, they use Stirling engines, and their heat source is the sun. There will be a small motor powering a small a, a concave mirror programmed to follow the sun and focus the sunbeam on that chamber and you got free heat. All right, now over here we're going to talk about a different engine. This is a model of an engine from the later 1800s known as a vacuum engine or a flame gulper and you'll see why when it's running. 
These were used in various sizes. Uh, there's actually a video on uh, YouTube showing one that is approximately 10 feet wide and about 30 feet long, and it's actually running a weaving mill. Now, here's the way this one works. We have a cylinder here with a lot of fins to cool it down. Inside, we have a piston that travels horizontally. Coming off that piston is a connecting rod, connecting the piston to the camshaft through the cam. Now the cam controls this little valve on the side going back and forth, and on that same shaft is a flywheel that allows the engine to go from one cycle into the next, and by spinning this flywheel, that's where we're generating power. In application, we'd have a pulley over here and run a belt or whatever we want to run. So what we're going to do, we're going to light up this little burner. And incidentally, we're using alcohol here as a heat source or as a fuel for our heat source. Now, when I bring the piston back, it's going to draw flame in through this opening. Then that valve is going to close off that opening. Well, now you have superheated air rushing in to a cool cylinder. The coolness of that cylinder is going to cause that hot air to collapse. In doing so, it creates a vacuum. The vacuum draws the piston back that way, and the flywheel kicks it over into the next cycle. I'm going to start it straight away, and then I'll turn it so it can be viewed from your position. And you determine the speed by where you place the flame. The very end of the flame is the hottest part of the flame. Now, just imagine this thing, multiply it by 30 or 40 times, and just visualize how noisy this thing would be to work around. Now, this type of engine was actually used on vehicles. There's an event held every year in England to commemorate something that, that would involve vehicles like this. And it's called the London to Brighton Veterans Race. It takes place first Sunday in November every year. The newest vehicle that could participate in this reenactment can be no newer than 1904. Because in 1904, England raised their speed limit. Up to that point, the speed limit was four miles an hour. And the law stated at that time, if you are going to operate a motor vehicle on a public road, you must have a person walking in front of the vehicle, waving a red flag to warn people a motor vehicle is approaching. Because the intent of the law was not only to protect people, but to protect horses, because you're gonna spook horses.